If a country is not prepared to deport massively the people who are not citizens, then they must figure out a way to integrate those immigrants in one way or another. Citizenship provides one way to do so in a manner that is uh, both respectful of previous backgrounds and the diverse skills that you bring, but also allows you to be a member of the nation. If you look at Canada and you look at immigrants who are eligible for naturalization, who have been living in the country long enough to apply, 85% of them have become Canadian citizens. And this is an incredibly high percentage compared to almost all other Western democracies. Part of this is because of the social support for citizenship. It's partly also because of the symbolic language that promotes citizenship as a means and a way of becoming Canadian. It's also because citizenship is not seen as the end point, the crown after you have uh, done an integration pathway, so you sort of get a medal at the end, but it's part and parcel of that integration pathway. So it's a way station on the way of becoming a full member of society. Now this has important implications because in Canada, only citizens can vote. And so once you have high numbers of immigrants who have high levels of citizenship, this can change elections. And particularly when you think of the big Canadian cities, especially cities like Toronto and Vancouver, where maybe up to one in two people were born outside of the country, when there's an election, politicians need to take into account what immigrants want and how they might be perceived if they have very strong anti-immigrant discourse. And so in Canada, there's been this feedback loop that as citizenship has been promoted and immigrants became citizens, it makes it much harder for politicians to adopt a very crude or simplistic anti-immigrant discourse. Now this doesn't mean that there aren't all kinds of questions in Canada about the pace of immigrant integration, whether it's getting too slow or whether immigrants are adopting Canadian values. Debates that we see in Europe around Muslim immigrants and concerns about religious accommodation also play out in Canada. And those religious accommodation debates have also had uh, Sikhs and uh, Jews as a focus in terms of where are the limits of tolerance in the Canadian perspective. So these debates are in Canada just as much as they're in Europe. But immigrants, because they are active in politics, change the way that the politicians talk about immigration and have promoted a multicultural discourse. And this doesn't mean it's because immigrants just support one party. One of the unique aspects of Canada is that you have immigrants who have successfully run for office and are sitting in the House of Commons across the entire political spectrum, from conservative to social democratic parties, and even the Green Party, where the leader of the Green Party is herself an immigrant from the United States. And that uh, insertion of immigrant citizens into politics changes the country. Canada's had a lot of success with immigrant integration and including immigrants within the national membership and citizenship. This doesn't mean that everything is perfect in Canada, and I want to be very clear about that. There's been research that shows that if you send a resume for a job opening, and the resume is exactly the same, but you change the names on the resume, the name that is Anglophone, that sounds more British or English, is going to get a call back at a higher rate than if the name was Chinese, Indian, or even Greek. And we know, based on research on income and employment, that immigrants in Canada, especially if they're what Canadians call visible minorities or non-white, they often will face a penalty in the labor market whereby their wages are less than we might expect given their work experience and their education. So there are problems in Canada just like there are problems everywhere. One of the things that provides some basis on which immigrants who face discrimination or face problems can make claims that they can say to other people, this isn't right, you shouldn't treat us this way, is the fact that there are these high levels of citizenship and the fact that Canada has birthright citizenship. This is just like in the United States. So in Canada and the United States, unlike any country in Europe, any child born in the country is automatically a citizen at birth with only very few exceptions for diplomats or people serving another government in some capacity. 
In Europe, just because you're born in a country does not mean that you're an automatic citizen. It usually comes with caveats. Your parents have had to live there for a particular amount of time or might even have to be a citizen themselves. So in Canada and in the United States, you have legal full inclusion in the second generation. So even if the first immigrant generation do not become citizens or are somewhat isolated, the second generation are full members of society. And because of that, the second generation can make claims on other people in a way that they can challenge discrimination and prejudice. And perhaps in a country like Germany, as birthright citizenship has increased and the grounds by which people can claim German citizenship have expanded, we might see changes like that into the future.